Because it's nothing but the blood that can save us. Amen? At the end of our service, we'll be having communion, and all believers are welcome to join us. You don't have to be a member of this church to uh, have communion with us. As long as you're saved, born again, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, you're welcome to join us. Uh, this morning, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be reading from Paul's second letter to the church of Corinth. 2 Corinthians. Last week, we talked about rebuilding the altar. You remember that? Those of you who were here? Talked about rebuilding the altar. And we had said that we had talked about the ancient Israelites in the Old Testament. God gave them a tabernacle, and eventually they built a temple. Solomon built a great temple. And in that temple was the brazen altar in the outer court, and there was the altar of incense in the holy place. And of course, in the holiest place, there was the Ark of the Covenant, which was the ultimate meeting place. And you remember when we talked about altars, we said they were places of meeting, they were places of sacrifice, they were places of remembrance, they were places where people would meet God. And we talked about when we first got saved and we first went to the cross, we built an altar there. How many people can remember when you first got saved? You might not remember the date, but you can remember when your life changed through faith in Jesus Christ. Remember that. And I have found, and I said in my life, since I've been saved maybe 25 or 30 years, I have built other altars. Because like the ancient Israelites, when they had their temple... They had, the, they had the, 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 the holy place and the holiest place and all that stuff. But as time went on, Solomon, when he began building that temple, if you read in uh, uh, first, or Second Chronicles, he said a prayer and he said, Lord, he dedicated the temple and the, the power of God and the Spirit of God came down and filled the place. But from that point on, Solomon began, as he grew and as he got older, he began, you know, he started off worshiping God, but as time went on, he started marrying strange women. And he began to worship their gods. And what he began to do is he began to set up other altars, other places of worship. And eventually, if you know the history of the Israelites, they began building other altars right in the temple. And it got to the point where they were so busy worshiping Shamash and uh, Molech and Tammuz and all these other gods that they worshipped, Baal, uh, the, the gods of the Canaanites, that the, the worship of Yahweh, the God of the Bible, began to diminish to the point where that stuff was just got shoved in the corner, like that organ over there, collecting dust. <laughs> if we don't use it, they didn't use it anymore. They had other stuff. And God was so angry with them, He would send prophets to them and say, listen, you've got to get back to where you began. You've got to get rid of all this other stuff. And there were some kings who would listen, and they would do that. There was a king named Josiah. And when Josiah came into power, they, uh, uh, the, the priests went into the temple and they discovered the scroll that contained the law. It hadn't been read in a long time. And when they read it, and they read it to Josiah, he tore his clothes and sackcloth and ashes and repented and said, we've got to get back to where God wants us to be. And there was a revival at that time where they tore down all the other altars and they restored the altar of, of Jehovah and they restored the, the holy place and all that. And that lasted as long as Josiah lived, but after he died they kind of went back to where they were. Well, in our lives as believers, I can remember the time when I built an altar unto the Lord. I can remember the time when I got saved. And I, and I, I, I went to the cross. Brother George was saying, you know, lead me to the cross. Take me back. I can remember that time. But since that time, there have been times in my lives when I have allowed other altars to be built. How many people can say, I've done the same? And these altars... Just like with the ancient Israelites, we, these altars, what they do, they become strongholds. They become strongholds. Fortresses. You know, if you grab it, when, you, when it first starts to happen and you put it away, it's, it's really, you know, you can do that in the name of Jesus. But if you let it linger for a while, it starts to get strong. It starts to grow. And if you let it go too far... It becomes a monster. It becomes like a fortress. We need to learn how to pull down the fortresses, pull down the strongholds in our lives. 
if we want to go back to the cross, if we want to rebuild the altar where we began our walk with, with Jesus, we need, as we start walking back there, we're going to encounter these strongholds that we've allowed to happen in our lives. And I want to pull down some strongholds. I've got to pull down some strongholds in my life, and I'll bet you you've got a few you've got to pull down. You don't got to tell me what yours are, and I'm not going to tell you what mine are. That's between me and God. But brothers and sisters, the way things are going in this world, we better get back to the cross. We better get back to where we, where we started. And I'm not just talking about two pieces of wood nailed together. I'm talking about what Jesus did there. In 1 Corinthians, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul had to write some letters to the church of Corinth. His first letter was full of instruction and correction. Because that church in Corinth, they had some problems. But they had some problems. Some big problems. They couldn't get along with one another. Everybody was trying to do something everybody else was doing. And uh, they didn't understand how to use the gifts. And they was, uh, there was all kinds of sin and stuff going on. So Paul had to straighten them out with that first letter. The second letter that he wrote them, Paul spends a lot of time defending his ministry. Because what would happen, and we've talked about this before, Paul would go into a city, and he would establish a church, and he would preach the gospel, and people would get saved, and a body would be established there. And he would be there for a while, uh, you know, ordaining pastors and elders and so forth. And he would leave, and as soon as he would leave, somebody else would come along and say, that Paul ain't nothing. He's nothing but a big mouth. He's a fake apostle. He doesn't know what he's talking about. So Paul would always have to try to defend himself or, or try to allow through God's word to vindicate himself. And he would usually appeal to their experience with him. You see, people can slander you all they want to. But the people that know you, they know what you're about. Amen? If, somebody, if I know somebody and they're a friend and I know what they're about and somebody comes to me and starts talking mess to me about them, I'm going to say, wait a minute, I know him. If it's somebody I don't know, I'll say, well, I don't know. See, your true friends, they know you. See, Paul, he appealed. He said, you remember when I was with you, if you read his letters, he says, you remember when I was with you, I didn't take anything off of you. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't steal money off you. I didn't make demands on you. All I did was preach the gospel to you. That's what he said. And in chapter 10, what Paul is doing, he's beginning, he's defending himself against those people that would come along and say, he's nothing but, a, he's, he's, just, he's just in the flesh. He's not in the spirit. And listen to what he says. He says, now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beseech you, in verse 2, that I may not be bold when I am present, with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold. In other words, he's saying, don't let me come over there. <laughs> you ever say that to your kids? You know, don't let me come in there. Okay. He says, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as we walk according to the flesh. Paul's saying, there are these people that are coming to you saying that Paul, he's walking in the flesh. He doesn't, he, he's not tuned into the spirit. He's not spiritual. He's just speaking his own mind and so forth. Paul says, listen. He says this. For though we walk in the flesh, you know, we walk in the flesh. All of us, what are we walking? What are these things we got that we're living in right here? This is flesh. We're walking in the flesh. I am subject to the issues of my flesh. If somebody steps on my toe, I hurt. Okay? If, if I hit my, my finger with a hammer, I hurt. I'm subject, to the, I'm subject to the issues of the flesh, aren't we? We all are. But he says, though I walk in the flesh, according to the standards and rudiments of the fleshly demands, he says, though I walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We're in the flesh, but by our flesh we can do nothing. We can't battle. We can't war. If you try to fight your battles in the flesh, he says in the letter to the Ephesians, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. That's why when we talk about you know, electing the right president, electing the right senator, I'm all in favor of voting. I, I think we ought to do that. Thank God for that. But you know what? They're not going to fix the problem. Being in the flesh is not going to fix your problem. You're not going to be able to pull down your strongholds with 12 steps, 7 steps, 10 steps, Dr. Phil, Dr. Drew, whatever. You're not going to be able, that, they're not going to tell you how to overcome your problems. They're not going to tell you how to pull down your strongholds. Because they don't even care about it. They don't even believe in getting back to the cross. To them, it's all flesh. To them, it's all mind over matter. It's willpower. But there's nothing we can do of our own will. There's nothing we can do in our flesh. There's nothing. We can't get back to the cross by willing to. We need, we need to understand that our warfare is not in the flesh. It's spiritual. There's too much of what passes for church and religion today that has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. I need the Holy Spirit. If I'm going to overcome my problems, I'm not going to do it. With medication, I'm, I need the Holy Spirit. And I'm not saying you shouldn't take medication if the doctor gives it to you. I'm just saying we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Ghost. He's the one that can heal us. He's the one that can give us hope. He's the one that can give us peace in the midst of all kinds of troubles. If you're struggling and you've got all kinds of stuff going on, there's not, sometimes you're go, you go through things, there's nothing that anybody can say to you that can make you feel better. How many know what I'm talking about? But the Holy Spirit can bring peace. The Holy Spirit can give you confidence that it's in His hand. He says, though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. It's not a fleshly battle. The gay agenda folks, they're not my enemy. The Democrats or Republicans are not my enemy. The Obamacare, same-sex mayor, whatever. Fill in the blank. That, the people aren't our enemy. They're just folks who have believed a lie. Our enemy is spiritual. And if we want to overcome, we got to do it in the spiritual realm. He says this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. We can't win by the flesh. We can't willpower. Not going to do it. So, you know, psychiatric, uh, counseling, psychologists, psychiatrists. Not going to do it. He says the weapons of our warfare are not things we can learn in a book or things we can learn in college or things that we can medicate. or well, The weapons of our warfare, he says, are mighty, are not carnal, but they're mighty through who? Through God. To the pulling down of strongholds. Listen, the weapons of our warfare is not a nine millimeter. You might own one. That's okay. <laughs> but the weapons of our warfare what did Paul say in Ephesians? He said, put on the armor of God. Put the armor of God. The breastplate of righteousness. The shield of faith. We put out the fiery darts of the wicked. The helmet of salvation, protecting our mind. Convincing. Do you know how many people call me up and say, oh, I think I committed the unpardonable sin. And I tell them, if you're worried about it, you didn't. We need to cover our brain, our mind, our thought. Because this is, this, is where, this is where the enemy starts. You know, our friend Teresa, who just passed away, uh, she said something, she used to say, it's from the neck up. It begins here. It doesn't begin here. It begins here. We need to cover our mind. We need to cover our brain. We need to gird our loins with the gospel of truth, with what this word says. There's too many things passing for religion that ain't preaching this word. If you're not preaching, if this word doesn't, can't help you. Nothing can help you. We have the helmet of salvation, the gospel of peace. We, 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 we wear the shoes of the, the gospel of peace we, we, uh, to protecting where we walk. The knowledge of the gospel. And finally, we have the sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. Not just the written Word of God, but the Word of God that gets planted in here. That's our weapons. If we're going to start pulling down strongholds, we need to cover our mind. We need to cover our heart. We need to cover our loins. We need to get the sword of the Word of God. We need to get the shield of faith. We need to find all our, all our ammunition and all our weapons right here. This is, this, is, this is what will get us back to the cross. 
No amount of counseling will get you there. No amount of books written, uh, uh, you know, and all these other things. Some of those things sometimes can be helpful in, a, in, a, in, in certain ways if the right person re- reads them. But w- when it comes right down to it, you can throw all of them away because it's all going to come back here. Man, they, spend, they make a lot of money with books telling you how to live right. You know that? You can get a Bible for free. We're going to have the Gideons here in a couple weeks. They'll give you a Bible for free. It won't cost anything. Man, you can go out and spend lots of money on books and how to do this and how to do that. It's all here. Now listen. He says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God, what? To the pulling down of strongholds. Fortresses of resistance that have been established in our lives. Corrupt thinking. Things that resist the gospel. Things that resist the move of Christ in your life. How many times have we been in a place in our lives where we said, Oh God, I wish you would move. And we start to move in the, you know, uh, move in the Spirit and we start to get somewhere and all of a sudden it's like uh, somebody pours a bucket of cold water on you. Stronghold. Something raises its ugly head that you've allowed to, that you've allowed to go on. We have the weapons of our warfare that we can pull these things down. You don't have to be subject to those strongholds, these fortresses that we've allowed Satan to establish in our lives, these places where he has like a, like a, a leverage point. You know, if, if, you, if you want to move something, you, if you ever studied this in science, who was it? I think it was uh, Aristotle or Arch- Archimedes or somebody said, give me a lever and a place to stand, I could move the earth. You ever, you ever hear that? You ever try to lift something up, you can't lift it up? You get a little rock and a big long stick, you can get underneath here. Right? We give Satan places where he can leverage against us. These strongholds where, where he knows just he knows just what button to push, what string to pull. Because we've invited him in. We let him have this much at one time. And after so many years, he takes this much. Then we let him have this much. This happened in churches. Satan will creep into church. We'll let him sit on the steps. Next thing you know, he got, a, he got a stand put up inside the church. I always like to use that, you know. He sets up his place where he can sell his stuff. We, we need to grab it when it first starts. When we first start recognizing Satan trying to infiltrate our lives, we need to put it to, put it to an end right there. But there are things that we've let go on and on and on, and they've established a stronghold. You don't have to be subject to those strongholds. Because we have weapons. You need to determine and say, I'm going to refuse to relinquish control of my life to anything but the Holy Spirit. And when those strongholds pop up, and they try to, and they try to shake you and move you, you need to say, get thee behind me in the name of Jesus. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I reckon myself dead to sin and alive to God through Jesus Christ. We need to speak these words. And keep speaking them. You know, we'll, we'll speak them for like a couple days and forget about them. I mean, this is like every day. You know, I don't know about you, but Satan tries to mess with me every day. We need to speak the words that are written in God's Word to pull down strongholds. And listen to what he says. We pull down strongholds. He says, casting down imaginations. And now, let's stop and think for a minute. No. Oh. We all have an imagination, don't we? We all have an imagination. They can be used for good things. You can envision work for God. You can envision ministry for other people. But how many people know? You can also envision things that aren't so holy. I'm, I'm talking. Somebody's, somebody's getting, somebody is getting anxious. Because <laughs> we turn things over in our mind. Just... Just ask yourself this question. What if God took the thing you, things you imagined in the last three days and showed them on a projector? <laughs> Whoa. You might be looking for a new pastor. <laughs> you know, get them under the blood. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I'm, you know, you got to get them under the blood. But come on, let's face it. I don't, maybe no, nobody else in here will admit to it. But let's face it. 
All you got to do is drive around Pittsburgh a couple days. Maybe you'll have a few of them. Okay? You know what I'm talking about. Imaginations. I've learned not to say it. Especially when I got my wife in the car. <laughs> I learned not to say it. When I'm driving, and I've learned not to say, but she can tell anyhow, because I, you know, all right. Anyway. Right. Imaginations. It starts here. Sin starts here. If you, if, if you turn to James, he says, it starts here. It starts when sin and our lust come together, or the temptation and our lust come together, it leads to what? It leads to sin. It starts up here. And what we imagine. John is saying, I can only imagine. That's a good thing to imagine. I can only imagine when I get in front of the Lord. That's a wonderful thing to imagine. But what are some other things we imagine? Okay, listen. Casting down. We pull down strongholds. We cast down imaginations. Because the strongholds are like over here and we pull them down. But the, the imaginations are in here and we need to cast them, cast them down. He said, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The altar to Molech. The altar to... Chamash, the altar to Baal, the altar to all the gods of the Canaanites that they, that they built inside the temple. I want to ask you this morning, what are the altars inside of your temple? Remember we said last week, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit? We're the temple of the Holy Ghost? Know ye not, know ye not, you are the temple. What altars have we built? Have we allowed to be constructed? What are the strongholds? He says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Every thought, every intent, every agenda that is antichrist, that goes against what God has for your life, we need to identify it and we need to cast them, pull them down, cast them out, cast them down. And we need to be diligent. I'm talking to saved people now. This is, this is what's called working out your salvation with fear and trembling. This salvation thing isn't just sitting back with your feet up saying, okay, Lord, take me when you want me. We got business here until we, you know, when he calls us, we're going to go. We all have, he knows the date for each and every one of us. Whatever it's going to be, praise the Lord. I can only imagine. That'll be a great time. But until that time, I got, I got some work to do. You got some work to do not to be saved, not to even stay saved. But we need, we got some work to do to work out our salvation so we can be the examples. We can be the temple of the Holy Spirit. We can be the place where people come to meet God. Right here. Sad to say there's a whole lot of people who try to meet God and Christians. They've, they've gotten so far away from, from what they ought to be. They look at them and they say, you just look like everybody else. So we sang that song. We're a peculiar people. That doesn't mean strange. That means different. Set apart. There ought to be something different about us. People ought to say, man, what's with that guy? He's happy all the time. <laughs> but what's with him? Man, they cut him off in traffic and never said nothing or did nothing. What's with it? We, 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 ought, we need, well, listen, we need the Holy Spirit. He said, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity, that means every thought, Every imagination, everything that pops up in here, we need to grab it. We need to arrest it. We need to put it, if it's a good one, then we need to say, praise the Lord. If it's a bad one, we need to put it in jail. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The obedience of Christ. You want to pull down strongholds? See, I'm, I'm challenging you. We were challenged, as I said last week, uh, we went to our state convention, and the brother challenged the Church of God in Pennsylvania to get back to the altar. And if we want to get there, man, there's some things, there's some things we need to get out of the way. And we do it. The armor of God. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Every thought, every imagination, Bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience. I mean, listen, when people like Hezekiah or Josiah in the Old Testament, when they wanted to restore the temple to what it was supposed to be, 
They didn't sit back and say, well, maybe next month. Maybe we'll just, oh, we'll wait till the weather gets better. We'll... As, soon as, as soon as Josiah found out what the law demanded and realized how far the nation of Israel had fallen from what God's law was, he said, man, we need to get on this right now. We need to take care of this right now. Say, I want to tell you something. The way things are in this world, this is urgent. We need to get things right with God right now. We need to start working out our salvation with fear and trembling. We need to start getting back to God's Word and what He expected for us. We need to get back to the cross when we first got saved and all this other stuff between then and now. We need to cast out and get back to where we were as individuals, as a church, as a body. The church in the United States. God help us. We need to get back. And we need to do it with a vengeance. It's urgent. It's important that we restore our relationship with Him. Mine has been marred. And if you're truthful, you'll say the same thing. There have been things, I hope maybe there's someone here that can say, well, I'm all right, I praise the Lord, I, that's great. But I can look back on my life and see where I have allowed these strongholds. Innocent, nothing, you know, major, no major, you know, headline here. But just innocent little things that started out as, well, it's not so bad. You know, I said last week, when I first got saved, man, there was things I wouldn't do, touch, drink, eat, nothing. I was, hey, man, I was holy. I wouldn't watch. I'm not watching that. I'm not listening to that. I'm not. Uh. And as time goes on, it's like, well, that's not so bad. It's, it's all right. Do you know, some, some of the leading uh, musical stars that are, that are basically, and I, I just, I say they're like video porn stars. Some of, these, some of these girls, they started out in Pentecostal churches. You know that? You know some of the hip-hop rap, you know, with a the chain. They started out singing in the choir. How'd that happen? Some of these music stars that have died from drug overdoses, started singing in church. Hallelujah. Find the glory. It's children. What happened? Well, well, yeah, it's it, all, everybody, all the kids are doing it. It's all right. You know, I forget what the number is, but you know what the percentage of kids being raised in evangelical churches today, that when they get old enough, they leave? Kids who go to Sunday school every Sunday. Kids who get the stars for their scripture memorization. All this other stuff. Do you know how many of them, when they, when they get old enough, they leave? Well, yes, Sunday, we got that going. But the rest of the week, well, it's not too bad. How many pastors, ministers, who have served, taught the word and served the Lord end up well, I'm not sure if that's all true. Well, you know, the thing about Jesus. It started out as just a little seed. It started out as a little thought. And instead of grabbing that thought and choking it and saying, get behind me, Satan, it said, just entertain. Well, it's just... And the next thing you know, it's a fortress. I want to tell you something. I can't pull that fortress down. But with God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. There's nothing that you have done. There's no sin you have committed. There's no thing that you have allowed in your life that God can't undo. But it has to be by the power of the Holy Spirit. It has to be by the power of God. We prepared the Lord's table this morning. You might want to, whoever's going to go down and alert the kids, we prepared the Lord's table this morning. The Bible says, let a man examine himself and a woman. Are you willing to examine yourself this morning? 
Are you willing to take a good look? Come on, George. Are you willing to take a good look at the strongholds and be honest with yourself? You, I, I don't care. It's not, it's, it's not important to me. Are you willing to be honest with yourself about the, the altars you have built that are hindering your walk with God? We're going to take a minute as the kids come and we're going to pray. I want you to pray where you're at. I want you to stand with me if you could. I want you to pray. I want you to pray with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, I stand here this morning humbled by the majesty of who you are. You're an awesome God. You're a holy God. You're a righteous God. And you have called me to be holy and righteous. Father, I thank you that I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. But I've allowed things into my life. They have become strongholds. I've tried to beat them, but I just can't. I come to you this morning. Before we partake of the body and blood of the Lord Jesus, and I ask you, Lord, help me by the power of your Spirit and by the Word of God and by the sword of the Spirit and by the shield of faith and by the helmet of salvation with my loins, loins girt about with truth with a breastplate of righteousness and my feet shod with the gospel of peace the weapons of my warfare. They're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And I want to give notice to the devil today that every stronghold I have allowed him to have in my life is coming down in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Every thought, every imagination, I'm taken captive. Every lie that he has told me, everything, I'm taking it captive this morning in the name of Jesus. I want to be a man or a woman of God. I want, to, I want to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. I want to be able to stand in this. I want to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. I want to be righteous and holy, set apart through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And I know it's hard to repeat everything I said because I said it fast. But Father, in the name of Jesus, as we prepare to partake of your Lord's table, this isn't just a ritual. But Father, this is where we come. We're coming to the cross. Not two pieces of wood nailed together, but we're coming to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He is able to tear down every stronghold. He is able to give me what I need to take every thought captive. That everything that has been said or done in my life that has caused me to compromise or turn my back or turn my head, Father, I'm bringing it on the altar right now. I'm rebuilding that altar at the cross right now in the name of Jesus. I'm tearing down the altar to money. I'm tearing down the altar to power. And I'm tearing down the altar to sex. And I'm tearing down the altar to entertainment. I'm tearing down those altars. I want what's righteous and holy. I want to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. When they ask